Okay, the next method is called a convenience sample. Okay, a uh, convenience sample is when we, I'm uh, just kind of lazy, we're just going to do what's convenient. Uh, we just kind of ask people near us. Uh, we might ask our friends or relatives and base our conclusions off that. We might uh, go to the mall and, and only talk to people that look friendly and look like they'll actually respond to us. Um, see a convenient sample when you go eat at a restaurant and they have those cards that say, uh, if you like your service, please leave us a comment, um, meaning they're only going to get responses from people that want to, which is very kind of convenient to ask on that. Uh, and then the last method that we'll discuss is something called a stratified sample. Uh, and stratified sample is when we've uh, actually categorized the, the population and we've broken them up into subgroups based on some category. Um, for example, gender. We might break the population up into gender and, and ask a certain number of males a question and a certain number of females a question. Uh, might break it up by race or by age, height. I don't know why we would do that, but um, we could do that. Okay, so let's uh, look at some examples and practice naming different types. Uh, you're conducting a survey of students in the dorm. You choose your sample by knocking on every tenth door. Uh, the fact that you're asking the same number, but you randomly picked a starting spot and you're, you're asking a consistent number past that. So every tenth door, 20th, 30th door, 40th door, etc. This would count as a systematic. Uh, the survey opinions proposed on a new water line, a research firm randomly draws the addresses of 150 homeowners from a list of public homeowners. Uh, this was a textbook simple random sample. Uh, agriculture inspectors from Jefferson County check the levels of residue from three common pesticides on 25 years of corn from each of the 104 uh, corn fields. Uh, and so here they've, they have to think a little bit carefully about what, what it is they did. So they first looked at uh, the type of farm that you were, and then they randomly picked within that type. So they had to sort you first. So they had to decide that you were a corn producing farm. So this would be a uh, stratified sample. Uh, anthropologists determine the average brain size of early Nathanderols in Europe by studying skulls found at three sites in southern Europe. Well, did they do anything to pick that? Uh, well, it turns out they actually didn't have too much choice. They got what they got. Um, so it was a convenient sample. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's representative, but it's all they have to work with, so they'll make uh, conclusions based off that. Okay, a statistical study suffers from bias if its design or conduct tends to favor certain results. In an observational study, research observe or measure characteristics of the sample members but do not attempt to influence or modify these characteristics. They just kind of watch write down what they saw. Uh, in an experiment, uh, reachers apply a treatment to some or all of the sample members and then observe the effects. So, so they actually try to do something and see what the result is. Um, now in an experiment, uh, we actually break it up into a couple different groups. Uh, we have the treatment group. And the treatment group is the group of sample members who get uh, the treatment that's being tested. So they're the ones that actually get to test the new drug or have the new surgery or 
you know, whatever it is they're trying to test on. Uh, then we have a, a control group. And the control group is the samples who do not receive the treatment. Uh, it's kind of what they used to measure that the treatment actually did anything. It's based off the control group. Okay, uh, sometimes uh, the control group will get something called a placebo. Uh, placebo lacks the active ingredients of a treatment being tested in a study, but is identical in appearance to the treatment. The study participants cannot distinguish between the placebo and the real treatment. Um, so this might be something like uh, you don't want to give your kids real medicine, but you want the, your child to think they're getting medicine, so you give them maybe a piece of candy and the kid that thinks it's aspirin or something like that. But And then uh, you can use the placebo to measure to see if they're actually improved, um, which actually brings to the placebo effect. And this is when uh, the data suggests that the group is actually in getting benefits from the placebo. So in other words, the power of their will is making them healthier or is having an impact on the results and not the actual thing that they're testing, um, which does happen on occasion. Uh, statistic terminology, the practice of keeping people in the dark about who is in the treatment group and who is in the control group is called blinding. So if you don't know if you're in a treatment or placebo, uh, you are blinded to the results. Um, and then we have something called uh, single blind versus double blind. So a single blind is if the participants don't know um, they are members of a treatment group or control, but the experimenters do. So in other words, the experimenter knows what they're giving the participant, the participant doesn't. So that's simply called single blind. Uh, double blind is when the participant or the experimenters don't know who's getting what. In other words, um, somebody who has it written down has come in and given the medicine or given the control group and the treatment group, whatever they're measuring, and the, the person who's measuring the success doesn't know if the person in, in front of them uh, is the, in the treatment or the control group. So for example, if you want to measure a diet pill, um, a third party will come in and give the diet pill and the sugar pill to whoever they're going to give it to. They've got it written down on a piece of paper, who gets what. Somebody else is going to come back later and measure the impact on this. And so the measurer doesn't know if the person in front of them got the real medicine or the fake medicine. They're just calculating if there was a change or success of some kind. Okay, a case control study. Write that a little bit better. Or retrospective study. Retrospective means they're looking back at the past. It's an observational study that resembles the experiment because the sample naturally divides into two or more groups. Um, so they're it's a study, so they're not really doing a current treatment, they're not really doing a current experiment, but they're looking back at somebody else's results and they're making some sort of analysis off of that. Uh, the participants who engage in the behavior under the study form the cases, and the participants who do not engage in the behavior are called the controls. Okay, uh, for the experiment described below, identify any problems and explain how the problems could have been avoided. So we're going to look at some experiments and see if they uh, set it up correctly, and if not, then what do you think they could have done? Uh, chiropractor performs adjustments on 25 patients with back pain. Afterwards, 18 patients say they feel better. He concludes that the adjustments are an effective treatment. 
Um, okay, so you kind of think about what uh, what was he measuring, and just because 18 people say they liked it, does that mean it actually made a difference? 